Ladies and gentlemen, so glad you're tuning in with us. Like she said, last week was so amazing getting to be together and gather in person. It was also such a tease. I know for me, I spoke too soon last week during the announcements and I am just sick that we do not get to be together this week, but I am trusting that God is good, He is faithful, and I am just thankful that we still get to gather through technology that we have the opportunity here to still meet together. And so wherever you are, thank you for joining us tonight. And I know that God still wants to speak to us even amidst all the crazy. And so if you're joining us for the first time, we are in a series called Seven Deadly Sins, where we are identifying different sins that a lot of people have said, hey, these sins specifically, although all sins are equal, these sins, if you let them have a stronghold or a huge grip in your life, they can ruin you. They are deadly in their nature. And so you have to be on your guard against them. And we've talked about things like anger and pride. We've talked about self-indulgence in terms of laziness and gluttony. And tonight we get to talk about the deadly sin of greed. And I know for me, by the way, if we haven't met, I'm JD. And I know for me, one thing that's true of JD is I don't have a lot of stuff. I'm just at that stage of life where I'm 26 and I just don't have, I don't have my own house. I've moved a lot in my young 20s and I for sure don't think that I have a lot of money compared to some. And so when I first was given this topic, I was like, man, greed. I mean, I guess I can tap into like something. I guess I can hit something. But as I learn more and more about what greed looks like, I realized, wow, I am such a greedy person by nature. And I think a lot of us will be agreeing with that by the end of tonight. And so let's lean in together and see what God's word has to say about this sin of greed. And so here's one way that I identified what greed has looked like for me. There was this thing uh, because of Corona, because of all the effects that it's taken on our economy and all the things that it's done to us financially, our government passed something where people got what's something called a stimulus check. I had never heard of a stimulus check. I didn't even know if I would receive a stimulus check. I was like, all right, am I going to get some form in the mail? How will I know if I'm going to get uh, my stimmy? And so I guess one day was checking my bank account like I do every day. And I was like, what? Cha-ching! I saw a deposit that I didn't sign up for. I didn't know how it got there. I was like, I guess the IRS from my taxes know my stuff. I, I don't know, but I'm not really asking questions. All I see is I got money that I didn't work for and it felt good. And what was my first reaction? I was like, man, I'm gonna save this. No, it was like, I'm gonna go out tonight. I, dinner is on me. I'm gonna buy those new pair of Nikes I've been looking at over, uh, over there. And I just was like, this is time for me to get myself something because this was money, you know, I know for me, I mean, praise God, I know there's a lot of people who really desperately needed that money. And I'm so thankful that you were able to be provided for in that way. But for me, luckily, like I've gotten to keep working. And so this in my selfish mind just looked like some extra cash. And so what do I do with my extra cash? I spend it on something extra with the extra self that I am. And so I get my check. And I, the first thing I thought was, what can I do for myself? And what it for sure was not is, is there any way I can use this for others? I mean, think about what a Christian, like what we claim to be about. You would think that somewhere in there in my heart, somewhere in, inside of me, I would think there are so many people right now who don't have a job. JD, you have a job. There are so many people out there who have never had a job. There are homeless people. There are sick people. There are families in need. And you would have thought maybe, just maybe, I would have thought to help others out with my check. But no, my first reaction was to spend it on myself because that's what greed does. Greed makes life all about you and it makes it nothing about others. But a lot of times we can't really see 
greed. Because greed, it wears a lot of masks. It disguises itself in forms of things like, man, I'm being resourceful. Or, hey, I deserve this. I've been working really hard. Or, hey, I'm putting that into my savings. It's good to save. Or, hey, I'm just trying to be a good steward. I need this money because one day I have a plan to upgrade for my family. We're going to have more kids. And it disguises itself in so many things that look good on the outside, but on the inside, the motives are all out of whack. And we're doing all of these things, although them in themselves are not bad, we do them with wrong motives. And deep down, we do it for comfortability and we do it for our own desires. And I wanna tell you this before we get started. If you live this life, If you live a life where you are convinced that you're not greedy, but yet somewhere in there, you're motivated by greed, you're gonna live this this way that tells you, okay, in this, I'm gonna find security and satisfaction, but you never will. Instead, you're gonna find an upbringing of anxiety and worry and comparison and discontentment and exhaustion from striving to succeed, to achieve more and more and more. And so I think it's important that we expose tonight greed for what it really is so that way we don't live a life slave to it. And so I'm not going to teach you. I'm going to let God's word teach you. And so if you have your Bible, let's see what Jesus teaches about this idea of greed. As you get your Bible, we're going to do, we're going to read a lot of Bible tonight. So if wherever you're at in your house, if you don't have your Bible, go get your Bible, grab it. And open it up with me to the book of Luke chapter 12. And while you turn there, for all my note takers, here's what we're going to be covering tonight. Tonight we're covering the difference between what greed says and what God says. Okay? The difference between what greed says and what God says. So the first thing, the first thing that greed says, before we read the text, is greed says... Everything I have is from me. But God says everything you have is from him. Okay? Greed says everything I have is from me or because of me. But God says, no, everything you have is because of him. So Luke chapter 12, hope you're there. Jesus teaches more on this. Here's a little bit of context. A great crowd is gathering around Jesus and they're asking him all these questions. He's starting to be identified as a, as a great teacher. And this guy, we don't know who he is. He raises his hand and he's like, hey, Jesus, my, uh, my brother, he won't give me my half of our inheritance. Can you go tell him, like, dad, can you go tell him to like give me half of my, our share? And Jesus looks at him and says, dude, I'm not the boss of you or your brother. But then he kind of like goes off and gives a quick little dad lesson. Here's what he says in verse 15. Then he said to them, watch out, warning, caution. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, a parable, we talk about him a lot here. Luke is filled with parables. They're basically just, that's just a way of saying a story that is kind of laced in wisdom and deeper insight for us to take away. He says this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Talk about the American dream. But God said to him, verse 20, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And so here's what this looks like today. Just really quick, like modern day, this story. Everyone at one point, hopefully, if you haven't, no shame, but if you've moved out of your parents' house, you have built up things for yourself from your childhood and you have accumulated a lot of things. And then you get to this point where you have to now move uh, maybe to college and you have to move into this smaller room, a dorm that you're sharing with someone else and everything you have cannot fit in this small space. And so what do you do? You give it away to the needy and the poor. No, that's not what you do. You get your extra stuff and you put it in plastic bins and then you put it in like an attic or some people go as far as to purchase or rent these things called storage units where they literally pay people to keep their extra stuff that they think one day they'll need, but in reality, it'll just contain dust and they might not ever see it again. 
It's crazy. And it's very normal here in America for us to build bigger barns like we see here in this guy's story. A lot of us though, we don't even store our extra stuff. We ain't even trying to hide that we're extra. I know for me, I got stuff laying everywhere that I don't necessarily need and it's a whole lot of extra. Things like shoes. I love shoes. I have a lot of shoes. For some of you ladies, you might have a lot of extra purses out there. I don't wanna, I know I'm treading on whatever, but clothes. I know for me, I have a lot of hoodies. I'm a big hoodie guy. I don't understand it. Money. And some of you right now are like, no, trust me, that's the one thing, pal, especially right now with Corona, I do not have an extra amount of money. But then I think Jesus would even lean in and say, okay, well then how are you paying for your Spotify premium or Apple Music? How do you have Netflix, Hulu? How do you manage to somehow go out to eat all the time or uh, go out every weekend? That Xbox you got, you have extra money. Some of you, it might be extra time. You might say, I'm too busy. I don't have extra time. I have too much going on and any free time I do get, I need it for me, for hashtag self-care. Haven't you ever heard? I need to rest. And some of us, it might be our emotions. Hey, I just only have so many. This is my personality. This is the way I am. I can't be giving away all these emotions that are a lot of work for me. And so we, we protect these things and we store these things for ourselves, And we think that all of the extra that we have it has a place and that place usually doesn't involve other people. It involves making our life more comfortable. And these things, hear me, in and of themselves, music isn't bad. Xbox, not bad. Netflix, but not bad. God has given us things like music. God has given us time and emotions, but how we steward these things, how we use these things, the why behind we have these things says a lot about our relationship with those things and says a lot about where we are at in our heart with greed. And I believe if you are so um, unsure, if you don't want to help other people and use your things with other people, if you protect your time and your space and your money and your things, and if you're the only one, I would say that Jesus would wanna share this story with you. And so I think he still wants to share it with us tonight. And so, A lot of the reasons, hear this, a lot of the reasons why we think everything we have is ours. The reason why we're so quick to believe that greed, when it says that what we own is ours, is because we think we did something to get it. We think that we earned the things that we have. And so it's only natural to think, oh, well, if I earned this, if I, if I achieved this thing, if I put in the work and then I receive the benefits from it, if I receive the results from all of my work and my earnings, it's mine. I get to dictate what I do with these things because they're mine, mine, mine. And in verse 16 of this story, we see this in this man's life. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. That's what greed does. Greed keeps you isolated and it leaves you to make decisions on your own. You don't invite God into your resources. You don't invite God into your decisions of how you use your things and steward your things. He thought to himself, He didn't invite his friends in. He didn't invite, maybe if he was married, he didn't invite his spouse in. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And I'm reading this and I'm going, my crops? What do you mean my crops? Everyone knows in this day, if you're reading this, if you're hearing this, there was no machinery for farmers back in this day. Everything that they got, their harvest was solely dependent on the ground. And the ground to have good soil was dependent on what? The rain and sun and light. And I want to ask, who is in control of those things? God. God was in control of the ground. God was the one in control of his bountiful harvest. But greed doesn't let us see things that way. Greed doesn't let us see our harvest through the lens of God being gracious and giving it to us. Greed says, look at what you did. Look at how you earned. Look at how you succeeded. Look at at all of the things that you now get to dictate what you do with it because you earned it. I know for, I was 
thinking about this. Sorry, I was just reading my notes. And it says, uh, remind them of what a toddler is like. And I was thinking about how crazy it is that sometimes we think that we can look at God and say, mine. And it's been like this from the very beginning. Toddlers, you give them a toy and they start playing with it and start figuring it out. And they're like, this is nice. And then you're like, hey, share with your brother or share with so-and-so. And they're like, no. And they start crying. They're like, mine, mine, mine. And what's crazy about that is it's not theirs. They, it was given to them by other people who worked and got the money and went to the store and bought the toy. A toddler cannot do anything for itself. It only got the toy because its parents gave it to them. And so it's the same with us. For us to look at our things and to basically communicate to God, mine, I did this, I paid for this, I earned this, is crazy. I'm here to remind myself and remind you guys tonight that everything we have is from God. Nothing is ours. Greed will say, it's mine. But God says, everything is his. Greed will say, no, I took the extra four years of college to get this doctorate degree. Greed will say, no, I put in the work on Saturdays when everyone was out partying. Greed will say, no, I came out of the hole that was my family and came out of my small town and am now living the Dallas dream of success. No, I put in the workouts and the dieting and the discipline to get to where I am today. I, I, I. And so therefore, because all of this was because of me, when I received the benefits from my labor, it's mine. And why are we so quick to claim the things that are good? Like this guy was like, my crops, my harvest. If I'm like, my promotion, my paycheck, my new shoes. But yet the moment that things go bad in our lives, the moment that things don't go how we want them to, that's when we're like, this one's yours, God. Like that's when I realized that I'm quick to put the blame and like the power in God's hand. When things go bad, when I'm in a wilderness season, when I'm in a dry season, when storms come, I'm like, God, it's yours, it's yours, take it, you're in control. I know you're in control. But when life is good, when I don't need to depend on God, I'm like, it's mine, I've got it. I got myself here. But that's crazy because the reality is, is nothing has ever been ours to begin with. I don't care how bad your life is right now. I don't care if you're flourishing and thriving and Corona has brought you more work than ever before. All of it is God's. And God has always been the provider and sustainer of our flourishing, of everything that we have. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything in it. And I know for me, when I start to get puffed up with my work ethic, when I start to get puffed up with my success or my promotion or my pay raise or the th my gifts or the things that I can do, I have to go to the word of God and remind myself that pride always comes before the fall. Greed is tricky. It tells you, hey, you have to do these things. You have to do these things so that way you can be comfortable. You have to earn. And so I have to go back to the word of God and say that it's never been about us earning. It's never been about man doing. It's always been about God's provision, God's faithfulness. And when I read the Bible and I remind myself of the stories that the Bible tells, that it's always been God. God spoke and the earth was formed. It was God who split a sea so his people could walk through it. And then when they walked through the desert after he provided manna from heaven and sustained them and fed them. It was God who flooded the earth and then refilled it, repopulated it and gave man a second chance. It was God who sent up a man named Elijah in a tornado of fire. It was God who defeated an entire army with nothing but a jawbone of a donkey. Go read it. It's in there. It's a crazy story. It was God who fulfilled prophecies. It was God who brought his son to the world as a perfect God-man to pay for the penalty of all of mankind and defeated death. 
It was God who told Peter to walk on water. It was God who fed 5,000 plus their families. It was God who blinded Saul, a man known for killing Christians and then converted him and made him Paul, the leader of the church. It was God who gave the blind sight. It's God who gave the deaf hearing, the lame walking. And it's the same God who is giving everything that we have today. It's the same God that has you listening today because he wants you to hear it's always been him who's provided for you. You haven't done anything. You've always needed him. And so come to him like a child. Don't go out and think that you earned something. Go, don't go out and think that everything is yours. Life is so much better when you admit that everything is his and none of it is yours. But greed doesn't want you to believe that. Greed wants you to think that you have a part to play. Greed wants you to think that life is all about you. And when life becomes all about you, it becomes less about him. And then life at first might seem like it's more enjoyable, but it only gets more sad. And then if you believe that, it'll lead us to our second thing greed says. Greed says, trust in yourself. But God says, trust in him. Greed says, trust in yourself. You've got this. But God says, no, trust in me. Let's keep reading. Jesus, he just keeps telling the story. He looks at his disciples now after he's shared this parable. And he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Verse 24. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, which was just a king, a character in the Bible who was very wise and very rich, even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all these things. And your father knows what, that, that you need them. But this is important. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Here's the problem of thinking we have to earn our, our things, of thinking that it's up to us to provide for ourselves and for our families and for our children, to think that it's up to us to have a comfortable life and a, and a joy-filled life. When we believe that it is up to us to fulfill our needs and desires, then we send ourselves down a path that has no end. It just keeps going because we were never created to satisfy ourselves. We were never created to give ourselves all that we need. God created us in his image and in such a way that he would, he, he would know that we were thirsty. He would know that we were hungry. He would know that we would be in need. And then he made himself where he could give us everything that we need and that he could know us better than we could even know ourselves. But if you get on the path of thinking, I can provide, I can do, I can earn, I can grow my savings account, I can grow my business, I can build a bigger barn, you're only gonna become more worrisome, you're only gonna become more anxious. And he says here, you're only gonna continue to, to chase after something that you're never gonna find. But somehow we think life is easier if we can just work harder. We think if I can work harder so I can earn more, so that way I can feel more secure and have more control, then I'm set, I'm good. But if we truly have control, then why are we so full of worry and doubt? Think about that, why? Why are, if I have control, if I'm doing so much, why am I so fearful? And why do I worry? And it's because most people think the core issue of greed is selfishness or needing more. But the actual core issue of greed is fear. The core issue of greed is fear. Because when you think that you have to earn 
And when you think that your plan, like you have to build a bigger barn to store your things, when you don't come to God and ask him what he would have for you, you're saying, hey, I have to control everything because I have to know that I'm gonna have enough, which is also communicating that I'm afraid, God, that you're not actually who you say you are. I know it says right here in this text that God looks at me and is like, hey, if he, if he gives the food to the birds and if he clothes the flowers, how much more would he give you the things that you need? He knows you, but just seek him. He knows you. I don't really believe that. Or I would just trust him and I would ask him, hey, what do you want me to do? What are your plans for my life? How do you want me to steward my things? And I would take myself out of the equation and I would let God lead, but we're fearful. We're afraid to give up control. And I don't know what it is. It could be different for every person. Something might've happened to you. Someone might've abandoned you that was supposed to provide for you. Someone might've broken your heart when they were supposed to bring you satisfaction and security. Someone might have withheld something from you out of like maliciousness. I don't, I don't know what happened to you for you to project this onto God, but I'm telling you, God does not fail. God will not let you down. He knows you and your needs more than you could. And so all he asks you to do is trust. Trust in him, not in your things, not in your money. We were talking about this earlier, how funny it is that did you know that on every piece of money that we have, I have here a $1 bill. It reads, in God we trust. In God we trust. It's as simple as that. But if you look around in America, no, we don't. We clearly don't trust God because we put more trust in this. We think that this can bring us something that God can't. We say, I need more, I need more, I need more money. I need to wear the on-brand stuff. I need a better job. I need a bigger promotion. I need a bigger house. I need more, I need more because God isn't enough. That's what greed communicates. And it's because deep down, we're afraid that God isn't actually good, that he isn't actually a father. And so that's why greed says, trust yourself. Because when you trust yourself, you think you get control, but that only leads to fear and worry. Trusting God is where true joy and peace is found. But if you follow greed, and if you think that what you own is yours, and if you think that you can trust yourself, you're naturally going to think the third thing that greed says. Greed says life is about what you can get, but God says life is about what you can give. Greed says life is about what you can get, but God says life is about what you can give. Luke 12, let's continue reading. Let's wrap it up. Do not be afraid, little flock. That's what he's saying. Don't be afraid. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why did the guy in the first story that Jesus told build a bigger barn? Why did he think that was the right move to make with his extra? Because he thought, I need to store up for myself on this earth because this earth is where it's at. This earth is going to bring me joy. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to put stuff into my 401k. I'm going to build so one day I can work hard and work hard and one hard because I have this dream one day that I get to retire and take this long trip around the world with my wife. Or I get to one day pay for my kids' college. And I'm going to work and work and work and work for this idea of this day that is not promised to us. Like the man in the first story, he did all of this work to save and store all of his stuff. And then God looks at him and says, you fool, you're going to die tonight. And you can think, you can be disillusioned to think that you have control of all these things. But one thing that you cannot control is the number of your days. You just can't. God is the only one who knows when we are going to leave this earth. And so are you going to trust in yourself? in your limited view of life? Or are you gonna trust what the book, what the Bible is saying about how we're supposed to steward our things? Because it says here that you need to store up things in heaven, not on earth. Don't build bigger barns on earth. Who's gonna get those things? But store up things in heaven. How do you store up things in heaven? By giving away things on earth. The weapon to greed is generosity. 
And so just a simple application that I had to deal with this week is, have you ever tried asking yourself, Lord, what do you want me to do with my stuff? What do you want me to do with my extra? What bigger barns have I built in my life that I need to take down and give away? Take some inventory, identify your resources, and ask God what he wants you to do with it. And ask yourself, I mean, get honest with yourself tonight. Make a list and say, if God asked me to get rid of all of this, could I do it? Could I give it all away and trust that God is who he says he is? And I know that would be hard for me, especially if I'm following myself and if I'm the one in control, because I would fail. But if I'm putting all my chips in with God, that is where an act of faith like this can take place. Life is not about what this man thought. Life isn't about your retirement. Life isn't about taking it easy and eating and drinking and being merry and getting more so you can do more. That is a sad view of life if you think that's where life is found. Jesus says here that life is nothing. It's a vapor, but heaven is everything. So if you're going to invest, invest in heaven. And how does he call us to invest in heaven? By giving during our time on earth. So I'll close with this. Talking about investment. If I could go back to JD at January 1, 2020, and I could say to myself, hey, hey man, you should invest in Zoom. Invest in Zoom and Purell. JD, January 1 would be like, what? <laughs> like, what is Zoom? And why Purell? Like, I'm a Germex guy. Or is that the same thing? I don't know. But point is, is I would look at myself and be like, you're crazy. I am not investing in Zoom. No one uses Zoom. And he's like, no, trust me, man. You're going to want to invest in Zoom. And I'm like, ah, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. And then now, how would I view that conversation? I'd be like, oh, I should have listened to future JD. I would be making a fortune right now. It's crazy that I did not listen to him. And in the same way, it's crazy, crazy if we live our life listening to greed and not listening to God. Because God says that everything that we see is his, not ours. God says that when we trust him, will experience joy and peace in life. And God says, life is not found in what you get, but what you give. That's where life is found. But it's like, but I'm getting less out of the deal. I'm literally losing something. What do you, how is that more for me? This week, I came across uh, a couple of hundred bucks that I wasn't expecting to get. And for me, that's a really big deal. I, I, I don't get to just like take those things lightly. And I was like, wow, I have a couple of hundred bucks. And I, I started to lean towards new shoes and I was like, no, save it, save it. And I put it on the table. And for the last couple of days, I've been prepping at the same table that the, the $200 was sitting at. And I'm writing this and I'm like looking at it and I'm like, I have been writing all of this message and not once have I asked God, God, what do you want me to do with that? And so I tried it. I took him at his word and I was scared of what he was gonna say because it was uncomfortable. I was like, please don't ask me to give it away. Please don't make me give it away. And what did he do? I read the scripture and he asked me to give it away along with some other things. One of those things being my time. I'm really selfish with my time. He asked me to start giving away, I talked about it earlier, but my emotions. There are certain people that I'm so closed off with because I don't trust them. That's just wrong, that's not love. And he said, hey, none of these things are yours. And I have to ask myself, why is it so hard for me to give away something that God says is so small? And it's because I forget the biggest thing that's been given to me. I forget that the biggest act of generosity 
came in the form of a baby born in Bethlehem in a manger, God sending his one and only son. He wasn't greedy, he was generous and he sent him for me and for you. And he sent him down to live a perfect life and to pay the price that you and I could not pay by dying a sinner's death, Philippians says. He was equal to man, yet he did not sin. And he died a sinner's death on the cross for you and for I. So that way we could live a life of joy and peace and trust that the Father is gonna provide for us in ways that we never could provide for ourselves, in the ways that we were never designed to provide for ourselves. The Father is the answer. Our relationship with Jesus is the answer. And when I start to remind myself that because Jesus was so generous with me, I now wanna live my life to be as generous as I can be. I want to live my life the way that he's called me to. And I'm sitting here going, God, okay, I'll surrender it. If you've called me to give it all, then I will give it all. If you call me to move to Africa and live in a hut and never get married and share the gospel with people, I'll do it. And that terrifies me because I somehow still believe that this earth is in game. But my Bible says that this earth is nothing compared to what's to come in heaven. So when I am fighting greed. When I am no longer wanting to be generous, what do I do? I remember heaven. I remember Jesus. I remember the price that he paid. And that compels me to put myself aside, to put my things aside and to make everything about the thing, which is Jesus. And it's so crazy. This like, this like view that's so upside down for us, especially those in America where it's like, hey, life is found when you give away your life. You you try it, you take the risk, and he does what he says. And it may not look like you think, but that's the point of following a God who knows what we truly need. And so just to recap, I'm done. I'm done thinking that everything is mine. And I'm trusting that everything is God's. I'm done thinking that I am enough and that I can trust myself. I'm gonna start trusting God. And I'm done thinking that when I somehow get to this plan for my life, that when I get enough, it'll satisfy me. And I'm gonna start believing that true life is found in giving just like Jesus gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, I understand that I have such a limited view and understanding of who you are. I have such a small understanding of what you truly want for me on this earth. But I pray tonight that we would be a people, if we are in Christ, that we would trust that that is the greatest decision that we can ever make. That is the greatest thing that we could ever obtain. Not because of something that we did, but because of all that you've done. And if there's someone here tonight who says, man, I'm just having a lot of trouble letting go of control. I'm afraid. I've, I've, I've been testing out the waters of this whole like God thing and this Christian thing. And I'm so afraid to dive in because what if God withholds from me? What if God isn't all who he says he is? I pray tonight that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would open up your word and read the scripture and see that it is not a lie. It is true, it is trustworthy, and it is for them. No matter what they've done, no matter what they've gone through, it is for them. You are for them. You are a gracious father who loves to provide for his children who just open up their hands and say, I trust you. And so that's what we do in this time. We respond with opening up our hands all across the country, all across the world. We are a people who are coming, opening up our hands right now and saying, I relinquish my rights. I relinquish my things. I relinquish my control. And I trust you, the God who has always been and will always be in control. Let's respond to that and agree to that in worship.